Hello, 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 coaches and leaders. I have a really fabulous guest on today, Jen Machen. And Jen, I just want you to know, I am like, you know, we have not talked a lot, but ah. I'm just a huge fan of yours. I'm a huge fan <laughs> of yours. And I'm excited for you to share with everyone. So our topic today is we're we're going to talk about two things that don't seem related, which is we're going to talk about how we can utilize the teacher evaluation system uh, to to foster a growth mindset in teachers, right? And it, it seems like they wouldn't actually go hand in hand, but you do such a fabulous job of doing that. And now I know all the all the listeners don't, some of the listeners do administer teacher evaluations and some don't. But what I want everyone to get is the formal evaluations or any kind of assessment on teachers is an opportunity to foster a growth mindset. So Jen, you are like, so, okay. Before, before we jump into it, um, I want you to share what's your journey in education? What have you accomplished around growth mindset with Mineola schools and what do you do now? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I, our conversation yesterday in the pre-meeting was fantastic. And I, I want to also thank you um, for what you do, um, because I think what you do is unique and, um, we as leaders and coaches, um, need to be able to, um, have our own kind of mini professional developments. And I think um, what you offer does that for us. So thank you. Yeah, um, yeah my name is Jen Majin. I am currently, I have just entered my 29th year of teaching um, or in education. I started my journey as a 23 year old in Mineola, Mineola um, which is a suburb of uh, New York City on Long Island, New York. Um, and I've never left. I stayed in the same exact district my entire career. Um, and one of the reasons that I did that was because I've, it, um, in my district, we're constantly innovating and our, and our leadership is constantly um, pushing us to um, innovate and to grow ourselves um, for the benefit of kids. And I really um, align with that mission and vision. And so I've grown myself in this district, um, starting as a special education teacher, then a teacher leader, um, and then eventually moving into an instructional coach, um, then um, central office leadership. Um, and then I had the opportunity to work on many projects, um, develop high schools and programs in pre-Ks. And um, I'm currently um, this year serving as an assistant principal at the high school in Mineola, um, building the growth mindset. And so my, my main role is to build the growth mindset culture here because we've done it district-wide. <laughs> you truly grow a growth mindset culture. It's not just a poster, you know, or beautiful bulletin board. It truly is a culture. And so I'm excited for you to share as much as you can with the listeners about what you've done to do that, because it, it I can't say it's enough. It truly is a culture, what you do versus what what I often see in schools is not culture. It's a uh, superficial. It's a yeah. thing that we say that we do, but it's not actually um, authentic. So I want to jump right in. Um, and I think this is super important. Anyone that's been listening to the podcast, I get on my, my growth mindset soapbox and I talk about what it's not. And, um, and so I would love you to share with everyone, what is growth mindset? How do you define it? So I think the most important thing um, when you either look up the definition of a growth mindset or um, I think that um, oftentimes we see here growth mindset and say like, oh, okay, it's I can, you know, um, make mistakes. I get better when I make mistakes or I have the power of yet. Um, those are all like things that I might say if I have a growth mindset, but having a, a mind, the term mindset is synonymous with belief. And I think the word belief is um, even more powerful because it's a little bit more tangible. Tangible. Um, so a growth mindset is the actual belief that you, me, I can grow my abilities, um, my intelligence, my skills, um, or anything if I believe that I can. Mm -hmm. And if I believe that I can, 
then I'm going to put the effort in to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, It might be really easy for me or it might be really hard, but I believe that I can. Mm -hmm. And there's a second part to that is after that belief system that you have to acknowledge that it's my choice to do that or not. I don't have to grow everything. I don't have to get better at everything. But if I believe that I can grow and learn um, and change my abilities, then um, that's having a growth mindset. Now, you shared something with me previously that has just stuck in my mind around academic mindsets. And I feel I'm just like thinking about it right now. So I just I want to talk about it. You know, I th- in classrooms, in schools, I see this growth mindset thing. And I think the mindset around growth mindset is if someone believes they can do it, then they will. And I love how you have choice in there. And I think part of choosing whether to improve on something or not actually has to do with academic mindsets because it's it's um more dimensional. I don't know why that's a word. It feels more kind of three-dimensional uh, than growth mindset, which is a piece of academic mindset. So I'd love you to share what are the four pieces of academic mindset, someone actually choosing to improve in something. So if we look at... Um mindsets as a belief system right so the academic so the belief that i can um i can grow my ability with effort growth mindset is one of the academic mindsets but there's more to that so um i always like to like compare what i'm talking about those academic mindsets with like maslow's hierarchy and so that starts with you know your basic needs and then it goes up to you need a sense of belonging and then then you can reach your full um your your full potential well it's the same thing if you look at this as a hierarchy like i need to be- i obviously my basic needs but then i have to have these belief systems about myself before i can even access the quality teaching and learning that's in my classroom so mm-hmm. The four academic, but I have to believe that I can learn and grow. Yes. Mm-hmm. I also have to be, have to have self-efficacy. Mm-hmm. I have to believe that I'm just capable, that mm-hmm. I, I can, that I can put my fir- fo- foot forward and do something. Um, the others are that I have to have a sense of belonging. I have to know that I belong here, that I feel safe mm-hmm. and I can be okay with not being okay or be okay with taking a a responsible risk. And the last one is that I have to have a sense of meaning and purpose. I have to believe that what I'm doing here is meaningful or purposeful to me. Mm -hmm. And if one of the, so Kamira Farrington from um, the University of Chicago wrote a whole white paper on this called Teaching Adolescents to Become Learners. So like adopting that term learner, I cannot be a learner if I don't have all four of those mindsets, because if I don't believe I belong, I'm not going to do the thing. Any one of those four things, we can actually, as teachers, diagnose that in kids. And if if a kid is not being engaged, it, it's because one of those four things are not true for them in that environment. And I love a that tangible way to be able to um, to figure it out. Exactly. And something that you, you told me is that when teachers come to you and say, well, you know, Johnny just can't do it. You, you actually ask you, well, you ask them, you know, what academic mindset are they struggling with? Right. And you said, it's always at least one of them. Always. Always. It's, it's, it does not fail when somebody's engaged and when we think somebody can't, first of all, if a teacher is coming to me and saying somebody can't do something, then I've already diagnosed their mindset. Uh, <laughs> right. right? Um, so part of our jobs as instructional coaches and leaders is to help shift the mindsets to say, yes, um, let's 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 diagnose the academic mindsets of our kids because they're struggling with something. They're not accessing your quality teaching and learning. And um, but there's a second piece that those academic mindsets, those things are true for everyone. So if I myself don't believe that a child can grow and learn or has like, or I don't believe I have the capacity or the ability to help that child grow and learn, Mm -hmm. despite, you know, um, the obstacles, then they're never going to do it. So I have to help them to say, what is it? So let's diagnose the child's academic mindset 
and Mm -hmm. then help them to realize that a mindset's a belief system, Uh right? Yes. Yeah. A belief system is true for me. Uh You and I may believe two different things, right? Uh So I might be in a math class and believe that I'm not a math person. You might be in the math class, believe you're in the math person, but then we go to the writing class and I believe I'm a writer and you believe you're not, right? So we're Uh believing different things, but who's right, right? I might believe, you know, in that all dogs are bad and you might believe all dogs were good. Why? It's because the experiences and the messages that we've received over time have, Mm -hmm. have um, led us, have literally wired our neural pathways to believe these things. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with these academic mindsets. So the, the, I think that like the magical part of this is that if we teach teachers about the, the that a mindset is a belief, and then we teach them to diagnose, and we say, remember, mindsets, they come into you believing they're not a math person, right? Mm-hmm. Because of the experiences and the messages they've had over time. It doesn't mean that they have to stay that way because we know belief systems can change. Well, if messages and experiences create belief systems, and mm-hmm. we know belief systems can change, then guess what changes a belief system? messages and experiences. So yes. hey teacher, you have the power mm-hmm. to change your environment so mm-hmm. that child believes this thing about themselves. You can actually with your messages and the experiences you provide in your environment, you can change and rewire this child's brain to access and so that they do believe they belong. They do believe they can, their ability grows with their effort. So once you diagnose that, then you can create a plan okay. to be able to create the environment in which they believe that for themselves. I love this so much. And I, I, I want to highlight something the, within the academic mindsets. I think something that gets lost when we solely focus on growth mindset, which is one of four academic mindsets is a couple that I just think get totally stepped over, which is for someone to be willing to grow and change in a classroom, they have to have feel safe and like they belong, right? That, that, that goes together. It's not just a growth mindset. And, um, the other one is that they oh, meaning the and purpose, one? meaning and purpose. Thank you. That's, that's, a, we, yeah, that, that's, a, that's oh, a big one. It's a big one. It's a big one. Right. And I, I've always felt that way actually about growth mindset. I, 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 it's been a, you actually gave me language for something I've always kind of intuitively felt like this is missing something. Our, our hyper focus on growth mindset is missing. Re- like I'm not going to work hard at something that's that's tough for me to achieve if I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm not going to mindlessly do that. That sounds terrible, (laughs) right? Like a horrible life to just work hard mindlessly because someone told me I could, right? That relevance and purpose. And when we are expecting someone to um, work hard um, and believe that they can when it is not relevant and purposeful for them, we at maximum can get compliance. Like maybe we could hold them accountable. And I'm talking about children and adults here, right? We maybe at best, if we can get them into action, we would at best have compliance, basic compliance, and certainly not engagement. And what probably would end up happening is they're going to, they're going to pretend, or they're going to show us that they're doing, making the change we want them to make when we're, when, when we're with them, children or adult, and then when we go away, it's not going to stick because it's not meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that you said that, that, that sparked some neurons <laughs> in my brain <laughs> as you were talking. Um, compliant. And so as teachers, sometimes the easier thing is for compliance to happen, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, even as teachers are like, okay, if they're complying, I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. So we, it's so, it's such an interesting thing. So as leaders, like how, how do we get, because compliance is short term, right? I'm Mm -hmm. doing it because I'm, I'm trying to get out of something, not because I'm trying to get something, right? 
So I'm trying to like remove a challenge from myself, right? So, or, you know, it's the lesser of two evils. Um, so how do we, so if we're, if we're getting kids to comply, we're not developing their belief system into believing that they can do this and that the believing that, um, and then creating environments in which they are actually going to be able to like access the full learning potential that is being delivered in the classroom. So how do we do that? And how do we use meaning and purpose to actually mean something to each individual child? Because, mm -hmm. but because, you know, we were growing up, you're doing math. You got to do math just because you got to do math, right? Or right, right, you know, right, right. you'll use math in the supermarket. <laughs> that might not matter to me. None mm -hmm. of that might matter to me. I might not be wanting to go to college. Why am I in geometry? It, mm -hmm. but, so we have to, once we diagnose that and the child says to us, no, I don't see there's any meaning and purpose. First of all, that hurts a little bit, right? As a teacher, but then you're saying, okay, great. What are we going to do about it? Where are we going to learn how, like what, what relevance this has to mm -hmm. you? And maybe mm -hmm. it's not in the subject area, but maybe it's in the ability to problem solve, or maybe it's in the ability to see that I can um, like actually start to love something that I hate, or maybe it's in the ability to whatever it is, but that's our job as um, teachers to like diagnose that with the kids. And then like amazing change happens. Yeah. So relevant to purpose does not have to be subject area specific. Exactly. It should really be about the learning. It really, you right, right, right. I love this. And I, it, it, I have something in my memory that you shared that I just, okay, there's a couple of things that I, I want you to share with everyone. One is I, I want you to share what the neurons do. You have this amazing way of sharing what the neurons do when, what needs to happen, sorry, what needs to happen for the neurons to, to actually solidify new knowledge. Yeah. Right. So, uh, based on like the, um, Neuroscience of learning, Carol Dweck's research, research from um, um, Michigan State University, where they put fMRI scanners on, you know, the brains of people and um, conditioned for them to make a mistake. And there's one great, sir, uh, the one great research um, that when they conditioned for the people to make mistakes, they had already um, um, put them into two groups of a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. They did surveys and knew who was in a fixed and a growth mindset. Um, and when the second that the person made the mistake, regardless if they had a fixed or a growth mindset, there was a flash in their prefrontal cortex, which was like the, they called it the oh crap moment. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh God, like everybody has that, like, oh God, something just happened, right? So there's a, the, where you think your prefrontal cortex, it was a flash. Um, and so, but only the people who had growth mindsets had a second flash. So that mm. second flash, what that revealed, and then the other one, the people with the growth uh, fixed mindset, the flash kind of dimmed. Mm. What learning is, is neurons connecting together. And the only way that neurons connect to get together is if they, in layman's terms, flash, right? And because they have to find one another. And so when they flash, they're starting to find one another and they're gonna send up chemicals to one another. And the only way they can start to connect is if they continue to flash and continue to send those uh, the messages together. But the only way they can get to flash is if they're agitated. And the only way to agitate them is to do something hard or something that you haven't done before, because if you've done the things before, you're not agitating the neurons because they're just there and you're, those pathways are wired. So when they're looking for each other, they have to flash, 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 deliberate practice, productive struggle, and keep flashing until they finally, um, until they finally connect. And then I have to do it over and over and over again to strengthen those pathways, messages, and experiences. So I had the opportunity, one of the projects that I did for an entire year, I was sent to the K- to pre-K two buildings. And my design question was, can you teach neuroscience to five-year-olds? So it was my job to come up with a language um, 
with the children to teach them the neuroscience of learning so that and our hypothesis is if we could do that then they would have a strongly wired growth mindset so then when they got because the research says that around second or third grade is when you start to when the when the everybody for the most part has a growth mindset like i can do anything and then when the outside environment starts like positioning you or you're in you know getting grades or or you know you're being compared to others you start to doubt yourself and that's when the fixed mindset starts to come in so we said if we really strongly wire their neural pathways for like i can do this with effort, then when they get to second and third grade and the outside world tells them they can't, they fight back and say, you're wrong, mom. I can do anything if I put my mind to it because Mm -hmm. I could grow my neurons. So our language became, so we would, you know, so the, 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 the first flash, um, would be pop. And how we got there is, Hmm, this is hard pop. Because the, hmm, the oh crap moment, is, <laughs> and then we would put our finger on our, you know, uh, chin and say, hmm, this is hard, pop. And then you'd say, huh, I'm curious, another pop. And then let me work at it, buzz. And if you keep working and keep buzzing, then you're going to keep working at it. And then finally, when you finally get it after a lot of productive struggle, zap. And then they zap together. So our language in our K2, now K4 buildings is pop, buzz, zap. And we have neuron stickers and we have um, posters on the walls and kids are running around with neurons all over them. And we <laughs> that's how we connect the growth mindset praise that everybody learns how to give with a tangible. So when we say, congratulations, you put in the effort, you just got smarter in our environments, we give them neuron stickers which shows them that you're, you know, which, you know, kind of puts together and makes tangible the the neuroscience of learning. I love this so much. And I can just imagine, I'm thinking from the adults in the building, teaching this and leading this, right? How healthy and beautiful for us, you know, us, I'm like, I'm there with you. Um, but the, this, give you all the stuff. We have, I have yeah. Tons of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's for the adults to be teach how healthy, right? To constantly be giving ourselves permission uh, to make mistakes, be messy, right? And to embrace it. It's not even just giving permission, but but it, just to be messy. And, and something that I very consistently see in schools is coaches and leaders dealing with perfectionism, right? And that is the opposite of growth mindset, right? The need to look perfect and put together all the time actually works against growth mindset. And I actually, uh, I want to, I want to move into, you know, uh, us, the, the coaches and leaders listening to this podcast, how you know, doing the work first, you and I have talked about this, the need to do the work first and the, um, the importance. So, you know, we're, what we're going to talk about is teacher evaluations, right. And how they can foster a growth mindset. The thing we're going to talk about can't will, will not be successful if the person administering it operates under fixed mindset, right? And something that, and I, and I want everyone to be really thinking, think, 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 think. Um, it's something that um, Carol Dweck wrote a whole article on, and I think she included it in her new uh, uh, edit, revised version of mindset was the false growth mindset. Mm-hmm. And what's what's happened is people just assume there's no pop, buzz, zap. Did I say that correctly? Oh, you got it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There was, you know, and it's you, I think a lot of times adults hear growth mindset and they're immediately like, I I have a growth mindset because it's been equated to being um, enlightened, right? Like, oh, I'm a good person. I have a growth mindset, right? And, And demonizing fixed mindset. When in fact, we all operate under fixed mindsets throughout our lives. We all do it, right? And so- I, I just want to challenge everyone listening to have a pop buzz zap. I have to do it with my hands <laughs> um, about growth mindset, right? Like actually challenge yourself. Where do I operate under fixed mindset? Not do I, it's not a yes or no question. It's where do I, right? And then thinking through teacher evaluations or even 
assisting my, my coaches that don't evaluate at all and just assist teachers in improving. Where, where do you, where do you operate under a growth mindset for all your teachers? Are there some that you're like, mm, she's just lazy. She's just waiting for retirement. Right. Do you have any thoughts that you would, you would like to, to share with our, with, with the listeners, with people about really checking in with yourself? I have so many. So I love that. <laughs> like, yes, like let's keep on with that pop on that because remember uh-huh. where that came from. The pop comes from like the, oh crap moment, like the, Mm -hmm. this is hard. And then the second flash comes from, huh, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have moments all the time where we go, "Uh, there's that challenge. And especially when we're coaching and we, and you know what, we might have imposter syndrome sometimes too. Like I might Mm -hmm. be coaching a physics teacher. Mm -hmm. Like when I was an instructional coach, I coached from pre-K all the way through 12th grade. So Mm -hmm. in the same day, I would go from a pre-K classroom to a physics classroom. And Mm -hmm. so I can't possibly know all of the content. So like, sometimes you're like, hmm, like maybe you don't trust yourself enough. And like, am I giving them the advice or the knowledge that they need? Um, But when somebody pushes back, or maybe you don't feel like you are as effective as you are, like that the first instinct is to pull away. But what happens then? If you do, if you back down, then your neurons stop flashing. So you're not going to get better as a coach if you don't just get curious. So my first advice when we have that is to recognize that moment when that happens and just pause and sit with it and then say to yourself, I have a choice to make right now. I can make an excuse. I can blame the teacher. I can blame the system. I can do that. Or I can just get curious and say, huh, what can I do about this? What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? So I need, I need to share with everyone. (laughs) Jen Jen has a sign that was made for her because she says this phrase so many times. It sounds like to everyone, to children and teachers and uh, instructional leaders, right? And the sign says, what are you going to do about it? Let's see it. Yes. What are you going to do about it? Do you know who actually made this one for me? My who? daughter's boyfriend. Because he he would come over and he's a football player and he would be taught and I'd be like, what are you doing about it? Like, why are you complaining? What are you doing about it? And I said, I guess I said it so much that he made that. But that's, I used to say it to my sixth graders all the time. But when you actually do that, like even as coaches, let's put that when you have that pop and mm-hmm. you say, oh, this was hard. There was the, like, this is my point of struggle. You can pause and say, what am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And then you're holding yourself accountable. So you can give up. You can Mm -hmm. blame. It's a choice. You can do all of those things. You Mm -hmm. can. You can choose not to do it now and do it later. All of Mm -hmm. those like are fine. You don't have to put a hundred million percent effort into every single challenge that you accept or or even accept the challenge. But you do have to acknowledge that you can. Mm -hmm. And if you did, you would get better. So Mm -hmm. it's a growth mindset is simply the acknowledgement that you could, if you wanted to, and if you put the effort in. Um, So as coaches, as instructional leaders, as, as leaders, we're constantly, you asked me how my day was today. It's five 30 right now. And I was like, Oh, (laughs) but, and then I kind of paused and I was like, okay, I could go off on the tangent or I could be like, you know what? I learned a lot today. I sure mm-hmm. did. I got my butt kicked a little bit, but I did learn a lot. Um, and so we have to be okay with that because mm-hmm. if we're asking everybody else to be okay with that, mm-hmm. if we're asking our students to be okay with that, right. if we're our teachers to be okay with that, then we have to be okay with that for ourselves. Um, and then you said the word authenticity earlier, like then people are, we're legit because we're walking our talk, mm-hmm. right? So then we're saying like, and then when we give the messages that you don't have to be perfect teacher, mm-hmm. like you could be teaching for 30 years and like asking for feedback, you can always get better at mm-hmm. anything. So like, mm-hmm. ask me for like what you need to get better at. And I want you to not be perfect mm-hmm. because- yeah. That's not good. That's not going to help you grow. And they don't, and then in my experience, they don't believe me. They mm-hmm. don't believe me when I say all 
those things because of that perfectionist. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I, like, I have another sign that like, it's like, you know, how to be like, a, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Yes. And <laughs> striving good enoughest. That's what Brene Brown. That's a cool one. I haven't heard that. <laughs> But, but yeah, so like to say like, okay, once again, acknowledgement, oh, there's my perfectionism again, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. I don't believe that person, but that's another thing that I'm going to create an environment where you, you feel safe because I'm going to talk about that, but then I'm mm -hmm. going to also create an environment in which you actually get to do that. And then I'm going to reinforce that you have, um, that, that, that that struggle is helping you grow. So mm -hmm. like I have to create that environment for the teachers as well. Um, and over time, mm -hmm. they will start to trust me, allow me to give them more feedback. And, but I don't think, and this is really important to me that our job as leaders or coaches or teachers or parents or spouses or friends, it is to like stop there mm -hmm. like like and let it be me like mm -hmm. when I was a younger teacher I wanted kids to do well because of me right mm -hmm. and I wanted to mm -hmm. be like I helped them but like I want kids to thrive well after me like almost like in spite of mm -hmm. the fact that I was even there. Like, I don't want them to even remember that. I don't want it to, to be like, because of her, I did well. It's because of me, I did well. Like I did this child mm -hmm. teacher, like I figured this out. And then over time, if they're getting better and better and their growth mindset is just propelling them to continuously be a learner, then they're going to forget where that came from because their neurons are just wired to be that way. And it mm -hmm. like, so I say, I don't want to like inspire kids mm -hmm. or teachers or anyone else. Like I want to empower them and I mm -hmm. want them to be able to say it's not because of her, it's because of me. I love that. It not, not inspire, but empower. I, yeah. I, I love that. You touched on something I would love you to expand on, which is to develop and grow growth mindset in different arenas, right? Different situations, we need to feel safe, right? How do you develop safety for psychological safety <laughs> for, um, your teachers when you are, um, giving their evaluation? So I really want to like dig into this. How do you develop the safety and, and how, how do we have that growth mindset show up? So we, we all in our districts might be in different, like, like, like environments, right? I might be a coach and an evaluator, or I might just be an evaluator. I might have the relationship with the teacher, or I might be just the evaluator that doesn't even know the teacher at all. So that's, you know, but um, I think that we can do that in any ways, right? So if we are an instructional coach, we have more touch points. We have like the more ability to develop that psychological safety, but I think we could also do it in a, like a one and done as well, mm -hmm. especially if there's like a pre-conference or even a, just a post-conference. I think you mm -hmm. can do it in any way. Um, I think, and the theme of kind of what we're talking about right now is um, being able to have your messages and the environments that you're creating and the experience you create, whether it's an entire year or it's just that one conversation, um, leave them with that feeling of safety and that I can do it. So um, how I've chosen to do this is that I pose the evaluation as an opportunity for them to grow, not as an evaluation. Um, I don't talk about points. I don't talk. We have a rubric that, you know, everybody has to, to me one through four. I never give points at the end. They can add it up themselves. But I was, I, we talk about this and I'm like, oh, where, like, what area do you, do you do thrive in? What do you, what area do great, do great in? And we talk about that. And then I never say, so what are we going to see in this lesson? Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care. It can write it once again, pre-K physics. I don't care. Um, what areas do you do well in? And, and then, uh, and what, at what area do you want to get better at? 
Mm-hmm. And that's what I most, the, the majority of the conversation becomes. Tell me what you want to get better at, because you now have this opportunity to have someone else watch you and give you feedback on something that you are working to get better at. And mm-hmm. a lot of, and when we pose it that way, a lot of times people are like, what do you mean? But that's not a like, what are you bad at? Like, what am I looking for? Or it's not after the fact where you're like dissecting what they did poorly. Because then I'm saying, I'm not expecting you to be good at it. Mm-hmm. But so I'm literally giving them permission to take a risk to push themselves out of their comfort zone, to not give me the dog and pony show that we normally give in in observations and to say, okay, I'm going to look for all those great things, but if you're great at them, I really don't care. (laughs) I'll I'll, I'll look for those things because you're telling me to look for them. And Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, thank you for highlighting those for me, but let's focus on the things you want to get better at because we're going to use this evaluation as an opportunity to get better. Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't get a lot of these opportunities because we're alone in our classrooms all the time. So we don't even know how good or bad we are sometimes. Right. Um, And that it works, it works. And the conversations, whether the teachers have been teaching two years or 20 years, they they just flow better. I even find with the veteran teachers, it's even better Mm -hmm. because you know, with the veteran teachers, we kind of feel like, oh, they're just coming in and it's just, you know, uh, another box to check. But now mm-hmm. they kind of look forward to it because they're like, all right, she's going to come in. And I was like, I don't care what you would. And I even tell them like on these areas, if you want to get better at them, then I'll give you the four, <laughs> the higher score. I don't care. <laughs> it's not about that. And then um, they t- they start to come to me. And then the post observations are great. They look forward to them because they're like, oh, she's going to tell me what I can, like, give me some suggestions on the things that I like want to get better at. So it becomes exciting. And so what that's doing is creating an environment and sending them the messages and then reinforcing those messages that that's what's important. Mm-hmm. So Somebody else might not do it that way. So if they're observed again and they don't do it that way, but they still have that experience that, Mm. that I gave them that says like, Hmm, but that is the way to do it. Right. But I can get better, but it's just the messages that somebody else gave me that doesn't define who I am. Exactly. And you just see so consistently and I'm, I'm going to steal this and I will give you all the credit, Ah! which is messages and experiences, messages and experiences. And I think from the Ted talks and the, whatever we've seen the power of yet, um, you know, we, we have that there is messaging that can impact a growth mindset, but it does not matter. It does not matter. It does not matter if we have beautiful, accurate messaging to grow growth mindset if there's not an experience to go with it. And that's why bulletin boards are not authentic in growing a growth mindset culture, period. I never, so in my classroom, when I had a classroom, I have pictures all over, like the only things that were up in my classroom um, were student-made or we call mm-hmm. we call students learners in Mineola for a very intentional reason. Um, mm-hmm. But like one of my learners made like in like huge like tongue depressors, power of yet up there and painted it. And then I went to the dollar store and I would get the black frames and like anything that was like inspirational that mm-hmm. or inspirational growth mindset, something that resonated with them, neuroscience um, that they had to generate themselves we would create, you know, we would put in the frame and then put it on the, on the, on the walls in my classroom. So like, that was like to us, authentic growth mindset, um, because it, it mattered. And we also would, um, I got all these neuron, um, stuffed animals that every morning we would talk about like our, um, like how we grew the night before, the day before, or like what mistake we made or what strategy we used or what aha moment we had. And um, we would throw the, we, everybody would go buzz and we would throw the neuron <laughs> at them. And then they would go zap when they caught the neuron <laughs> and they got to wear it for the day. And every time they did that, the kids would go, congratulations, you just got smarter. I love that. 
Oh, I have chills. Um, I and that's what that. I say to the teachers too, at the end, like, congratulations, yeah. like, how does that feel? And yeah. we just talked about them being bad at something for 40 minutes. Right. And like, this feels great. That's what, that's exactly what you want. Right. So you, they're going out and they're like, not, they're, they're feeling good because you're giving mm -hmm. them constructive feedback that mm -hmm. they need, that mm -hmm. we all need, yeah. but in a way that you're like, oh, that's what's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yep. what's important. Yeah. And that's, you know, I want to assert something about why you're so effective with this, which is you have your own growth mindset. You've done so much work on your own growth mindset that your way of being about this is, I'm just going to start something lighthearted. Um, you, you say, um, you're like, this should be fun. <laughs> this should be fun. Right. But your way of being about it, it's not heavy and significant and shameful. It's none of that. And so I, I you know, I, I, it's interesting. I've, I've tried to, <laughs> in my younger years, I tried to train teachers to do what I did in the classroom and it, it would fall flat because they would say the things I said, but didn't have my way of being about it. And so the thing I want to say is, if anyone listening wants to do what Jen does, you have to really make sure you are operating from your own growth mindset that you don't have shame and guilt around mistakes and messiness. And step one is to just acknowledge it when you do have that feeling. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. do have that, oh, I screwed up and then, or this was hard. And then you actually do the wrong thing or not the wrong thing, or do the thing that you've always done back away or blame or something like that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And just, and give yourself permission, give yourself permission to be like, oh, there it is again. Oh, there mm -hmm. it is again. Oh, I did it again. Oh, I did it again. Just that acknowledgement is the beginning of changing the neural pathways because if we're doing something over and over like a habit, it means our neural pathways are very, 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 very well formed and mm -hmm. traveled over time. It's going to take time to undo those and redo those. So mm -hmm. if we want to, we have to make it a habit of just acknowledging. Acknowledging, be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, you said uh you kind of blame or back away and um a term uh I use in my crucial conversations training is si go into silence or violence. Ah, mm -hmm. and it's a, uh, it's kind of an easy way. I think, you know, if you're going to silence or violence, you might be having, it's a protective stance, right. And you might be operating under a fixed mindset, uh, you know, just to look at it like, Ooh, I went into silence or, Ooh, I went into violence. Okay. What, what's happening here? Or, I noticed something, right. What's happening here. So I love that. Thank you. That was really, really great advice around that. Just, um, to notice, right. Cause we don't, the last thing we want to do is beat ourselves up. And then acknowledge the voice when another video that we have, we have like, you know, the angel and devil, my conscience on my shoulder that we have a video and we have two teachers sitting on like the angel and the devil. And like we teach kids in middle school, once we teach them actually what a difference between a growth and fixed mindset is to, to, to recognize the voice. So like, huh. And then like, I acknowledge it up. Oh, my fixed mindset voice has talked and I, like I had to do an activity where they actually name their fixed mindset voice, like Charlie and Gene, you know, and then, <laughs> and they start to say, Oh, there was Charlie again. He's talking again. And then it becomes fun because you're yeah. like, Oh, I, I just like, oh, because we're going, we all, I do all the time. My fixed mind, mindset voice comes out, mm -hmm. but I acknowledge that it's there. I sometimes choose to go with it, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I know I'm too using to go with it. I'm in a bad mood. I want to just complain for a while. I'm going to, but, um, I think that, you know, one of the terms that are in SEL lately, um, which is, it sounds silly, but it's really not is having a healthy sense of optimism. And mm. I think that that is correlates with a growth mindset too, because you're not like eternally happy all the time. Things happen and like challenges happen and devastating things happen, but having a healthy sense of optimism means I am going to get through this. I might not be ready to dive in yet, but I'm going to get through this because I know I can. I love this. Jen, this has been such an enlivening conversation. I love talking to you and ah! I so appreciate you sharing all this amazing stuff with the listeners. So thank you. Um, uh, I would love you to share if folks want to find out more about what you're doing in Mineola or reach out to you, ask you questions, pick your brain, where can they find you? 
Um, so I can share with you my email address, my mm -hmm. email address, um, Jay, it's very uh, schooly J Machin M A I C H I N at Mineola M I N E O L A dot K one two dot N Y dot U S. Um, I can also be found on Instagram at at Jen J E N N M A I C H underscore mindset works. Um, and I have an active Twitter feed at Jen Mage, J E N N M A I C H. Um, but if you want some resources, I think um, I, I, I talk a lot about those videos and Pop Buzz Zap and all of those things. Um, over time, I've created an entire series of um, K all the way through 12 um, growth mindsets, um, neuroscience. So our 12th, our kindergartners, it's like the neuroscience of the brain. When we go into self-regulation, then we go into growth mindset, and then we go into an emotional intelligence. And that is, um, they're all free and all um, on um, mineolagrows.com. Okay, so cool. I-N-E-O-L-A-G-R-O-W-S.com. Okay, awesome. I, well, I'll put all those links in the show notes as well. So uh -huh. I appreciate you verbally sharing. A lot of people listen on in their car and <laughs> on their walks. So they'll, they'll remember that, but then also there's, they'll, I'll put all of these in the, as, as links in the, the show notes. So they'll be able Great. to access it. So thank you so much for, Wait, when being... can I come back? Oh my gosh. I <laughs> can we just talk later? Let me, I'm going to, I'm about to drive home right now. I'm just going to call you just to talk. <laughs> this is so great. I, I would talk to you probably for hours. This is <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you for, for being here and sharing everything with us. Thank you so much. This is, um, this is fantastic. And that's a great way to go into the weekend for sure. Yes, I agree.